So hey everybody, welcome to ARE Live. I'm Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. And during ARE Live today, we're going to be joined by Mr. Mark Bailey, one of our wonderful virtual workshop coaches. And he's gonna run through an exercise from our virtual workshops. Uh, he's gonna go through a PPD, selecting rated assemblies based on building type, site, and life safety exercise. That's a mouthful and surely gonna be a lot of fun. This is gonna be a great opportunity to see how hands-on um, and in depth, the virtual workshops are. Uh, so that's what's on the uh, the docket for today. A quick mention: uh, it is February of 2021. A quick mention about N Carbon Prometric. The ARE is online. Uh, you can now test uh, both online and in person. And there have been some updates to the exam, but the content's the same. Uh, so they basically reduced the number of questions. Uh, they added some breaks and things like that. So. If you're not aware of those changes, in fact, I think they call it ARE 5.1 now. Um, uh, make sure you uh, check out the updated details. Also, because they made some adjustments to the exam, um, they had to update the, the cut scores for all the divisions, which they've done. That's all done, and now they're basically kind of cooking with gas. All the score reports are released. Candidates basically, just like you used to, uh, now when you take the test, you get your um, sort of anticipated whether you you know fail or, or whether you're likely to fail or likely to pass. Um, and then you get your results uh, in two to three days. So uh, we just shared a link in the chat for you to visit NCARB's site for all the details. Uh, so make sure that you uh, you check that out. Uh, for those of you who are new to joining us or new to Black Spectacles and joining us for the first time, uh, Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved test prep provider for all six of the ARE divisions. We offer comprehensive test prep uh, for the ARE with video lectures, practice exams, flashcards, and virtual workshops, which of course you're gonna get a sample of today. Uh, and it's all available online with either memberships for individual architects or firms or AIA chapters. There is something uh, interesting that I think you guys might wanna know. Uh, we've kicked off 2021 by launching our Pass the ARE Guarantee, uh, which um, you know the idea is that we're so confident that if you use our expert membership to the fullest, that you'll pass the ARE and we're putting our money where our mouth is. If you don't pass, then we'll pay for you to retake the exam. Uh, it's only available with our expert membership. In our expert membership, that's the only membership that you can get the virtual workshops in, which of course is what Mike, uh, uh, Mark is gonna be uh, sharing with all of us today. So I wanna let you guys know about that. To read more about the guarantee and in our individual memberships and, and so on, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash ARE-5 dash exam dash prep. Uh, which is a link that we just put in the chat box. Um, and if you want to learn more about, you know, how your firm can get access, which many firms have access to Black Spectacles, um, and essentially have your boss pay for your access, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash pricing slash group slash firm. And again, we just threw another link in the chat box for you guys on that. Our next ARE live broadcast will be on March 18th of 2021. We'll be hosting a panel discussion on the new ARE format, which I just mentioned to you. Um, we'll talk with people who have taken the ARE from home using the online proctoring. So this is going to be really interesting because these are folks who've already done it. They've gone through the whole process um, online, and uh, they're going to share some of their experiences with the new exam delivery method so you know exactly what to expect. Today we'll be engaging exclusively on our online ARE community. So I just uh, went over to community.blackspectacles.com and uh, I searched for ARE Live and sure enough, right at the top was pinned uh, the, uh, the discussion entitled Virtual Workshop Preview on PPD. So uh, head over there um, and actually we just threw a link inside of uh, the GoToWebinar chat as well um, and uh, you can engage there. What's interesting is everyone who posts in that thread on our ARE community will be eligible to win a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So if nothing else, just head over there to say hi and that will make you eligible. So you don't have to write a question if you don't have one, but I uh, just wanna make folks aware of that that is a resource for folks um, uh, you know, via Black Spectacles. Uh, and then of course, don't forget to stay tuned until the end of the podcast to see if you won that t-shirt. And um, we also uh, will be giving a special discount uh, on our expert memberships to share as well at the end of the uh, the episode. So make sure you stick around for that. 
My guest today, of course, is Mr. Mark Bailey. If you don't know him, he has been working with Black Spectacles for quite a while, leading the PPD virtual workshops. Mark uh, passed the ARE back in 2018, so he's a vet. He knows how to do this. He's an expert. Um, he's been a mentor to those studying for the ARE, both in his office and at his local AI chapter. And he's also an associate with Levin Porter Architects in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so uh, you guys are in great hands with uh, Mr. Bailey. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that introduction. You're welcome. All right, so today we are going to be, as Mark was saying, selecting rated assemblies based on building type, site, and life safety. Uh, so as we go through the virtual workshop, we start out by kind of frameworking, what are our objectives? What are the things that NCARB has identified um, as a target that we need to focus on for this particular topic? So we will identify fire resistance ratings required by different sections of the 2018, which is the new update, um, IBC, International Building Code, for a new construction building, as well as whether a fire barrier or fire partition is required. Uh, this exercise ties directly into the um, PDD objective in the ARE 5.0 handbook, uh, which is objective 1.5, determine how to detail the integration of multiple building systems and technologies. You must be able to detail and resolve the intersection of the roof, curtain wall, cladding, window, floor, structural, interior, and other architectural systems as they come together with the building project. So that's where we really start to look at, you know, firewall, fire barrier, and fire partition. And then it also accomplishes looking at objective 4.1, which is determined adherence to building regulatory requirements, IBC, at a detail level. So it's critical to be able to apply the International Building Code to the design and documentation of a project, specifically building use and occupancy, means of egress, heights and areas, fire and smoke protection, MEP systems, and structural systems, as well as material and assembly requirements. So whenever you're reading through those things, if you ever feel that they're, it's like, oh my gosh, there's too many things, break it down by, okay, we're gonna look at building use and occupancy. We're gonna look at means of egress. Then we'll get into heights and areas, also fire and smoke protection, you know, just kind of bullet point those important things that matter. Cause then you'll really be able to dissect, you know, not only a question, but what you actually are looking at in the NCARB reference manual. So let's go ahead and dive right, right in. Um, you, hopefully everyone had a chance to uh, take the type form exam or uh, practice quiz for today's workshop. That's just to give you a preview of what, um, what we do during the, during the virtual workshop. So the first question was, where would you use a fire partition? And um, if, if you ever get stuck, and I have kind of a fun mnemonic device, which we'll bring up in the end, um, the best thing you can do when you're studying, not necessarily on the exam, but always go back to your resources. Okay, so this fire partition, it's called out in the IBC. Let's look at section 708. A fire partition is a wall with a fire resistance rating that extends from the slab or deck below to the bottom of the slab or deck of the fire resistance rated horizontal assembly above. A fire partition may only stop at the bottom of a rated assembly above in combustible construction types, which is types three, four, and five. Um, fire partitions are also used at separation walls, walls separating tenant spaces in covered or open mall buildings, corridor walls, elevator lobby separation, and egress balconies. So if you look at the question and then go through, you know, Based on those definitions, where would you use a fire partition? Keyword being partition. Walls at shaft enclosures, walls separating tenant spaces, walls separating a building into two separate buildings, and walls used as toilet partitions. <laughs> so um, I had to throw that fun one in there. Obviously, if you know, usually on the, on the ARE, you find a question that you're like, okay, I know it's definitely not that. So you can go ahead and eliminate one. Um, and then if you get down to it, as we saw in the definition above, the correct answer is B, wall separating tenant spaces. So that's where they come into play um, when it comes to a fire partition. Now walls at shaft enclosures, that would be where you use a fire barrier. So keep that in the back of your head as we move forward. Uh, walls separating a building into two separate buildings. 
Okay, that's that would be a firewall. That's our most stringent requirement. So this question was was interesting because it was looking at okay, all three types are defined here, and then they threw a curveball for the fourth one. So that's a fire partition. Then let's let's look at what is a fire barrier and where would you use it? Go to section 707. So we're working kind of our way backwards in the code just slightly. A fire barrier is a wall with a fire resistance rating that extends from the slab or deck below to the bottom of the slab or deck above. So immediately we know something is missing from a fire barrier that was listed in a fire partition. This horizontal assembly above is no longer applicable. So we can't have a lid or a box within a box as we commonly you know, refer to a, a rated room. This actually has to go all the way to the slab or deck above in all instances. Partition, you can also have that in some instances, but a fire barrier must extend to that slab or deck above. So we've got to separate the floor. Um, fire barriers are used at shaft enclosures, interior exit stairways and ramps, enclosures for exit access stairways, exit passageways, horizontal exits, atriums. Okay, we see a common theme here. We're talking about egress requirements. Um, same thing with incidental uses, control areas, separated occupancy, and fire areas. So based upon all those things, we're, we're down to the question again. Where would you use a fire barrier? Walls at exit passageways, walls at egress balconies, walls at separated occupancies, both A and C, both A and B. So whenever you come upon this type of a question, what I always did is try to figure out what can I eliminate from what I know? And since we just read on the previous one that egress balconies are an example of a fire partition, we can eliminate that as an option. So then walls that exit passageways. Okay, that was just mentioned above. So we can use that. Walls that separated occupancies. Uh, we also saw that above, so we can we can use that. So therefore, the correct answer is both A and C. So these questions are, we use these as a framework at the beginning of the workshop to really get the juices flowing. I mean, we wanna, this is gonna be our topic today. You know, we're going in deep to the, the virtual workshop. We wanna really talk about it um, and get the concept straight because it is a lot to get your head around when you're going, going through and looking at the, you know, the overall concepts of everything. The framework is important. Okay, finally, where's the firewall? So if we look at 706, firewall consists of either two structurally independent walls that allow for collapse in the event of a fire on either side of the wall without affecting the other side of the wall. By using a firewall, the building is effectively split into two buildings. The firewall extends from the slab of foundation on the bottom floor all the way through the roof and stops a minimum of 18 inches above the roof. The firewall is also required to run from the exterior wall to exterior wall. So firewalls are used to separate a single building into two separate buildings. That's pretty much the main use that they're ever used for because um, they're, the, they're the most stringent requirement when it comes to a fire barrier, a fire partition, and a firewall of those three. So which wall section applies to the use of a firewall? A wall that extends from the slab or deck below to the bottom of the slab or deck above a wall that extends from a slab through the roof and stops a minimum of 12 inches. Same thing, stops a minimum of 18 inches above the roof. And then finally, wall extends from slab to the bottom of the rated horizontal assembly above. Well, we just talked about that, so we know that's a fire partition. And then if we go back and look at question A, we know we also just talked about that, that's a, that's a fire barrier. So we're automatically kind of down to these two. And usually sometimes questions on the exam are, are pretty close where it's just one character or you know one, in this case, measurement apart. And if we go back to our definition, we got 18 inches. We know that has to be a minimum according to the IPC. So that really are those three questions are to set the framework for, for the virtual workshop. And that's kind of, um, you know, that's what you need to have as as a basis of understanding um, before we really dig into where we're at now, which is the scenario portion. So um, for the rest of the, uh, I guess the rest of the questions we'll encounter, keep this scenario in mind the same way you would approach a case study on the exam. 
So you're going to have this, you're going to read through it, you want to make sure you highlight or call out you know, particular terms that you believe will be of use for you. So let's read through it together. Scenario, an architect is working on a four-story mixed-use building of type 2B construction with NFPA 13 sprinklers on the first two floors and NFPA 13R sprinklers on the third and fourth floors. An architect already confirmed that the, art, the area of the proposed building is below the maximum allowable area for a separated mixed-use building. Okay, well, that's good. There will be a cafe and an office on the first floor, offices on the second floor, and residential dwelling units on the third and fourth floors. So we've got a mixed use, as we, as we already know. Third and fourth floors with residential dwelling units are identical with the same floor plan. Now the architect must identify the required fire resistant construction within the building based on construction type, occupancy and separation requirements, life safety and egress requirements, and fire separation distance requirements. Use the exhibits provided to identify the types of walls and partitions required to satisfy the code. Assume that no, flaw, no walls or floors will be rated unless required by code. So we're assuming we're starting with an unrated building and we need to determine in the exam where, where the rated walls fall. So a lot of key words to remember here. Four-story building, mixed use, type 2B, NFPA 13 on the first two floors, NFPA 13R on the third and fourth floors. We've got a cafe on the first floor with an office also on the first floor, and then offices on the second floor, and finally residential units on three and four. So keep all of those things in mind as we move forward. Then you, uh, on the uh, virtual workshop, you'll also get you know, reference to any exhibits that you might encounter on the exam. In this case, we have a site plan and we have a proposed first floor plan. Always take note of the north arrow. You just never know when you're gonna need it. And then we have our proposed second floor plan and a proposed third floor plan. So they're telling us everything Here's, here's where the building's located. Here's our mixed use site. Here's our property line around the perimeter that we need to be aware of. And they're giving us the dimensions. So whatever they're telling you on the diagrams usually is important information that you wanna make sure you recall as we go into um, the actual questions. And then if we go back to the first floor, there's our A2, um, A2 occupancy for the cafe and our office. There's our second floor office, and then our residential units on three and four. Okay, next question. Refer to the site plan and the floor plans to identify the exterior wall fire resistance in hours for the following walls. Okay, so we need to look at the site plan and the floor plans to identify the exterior wall fire resistance rating. So when you're when you're approaching a question like this on the exam, um, you're going to find that you know these diagrams have information on them that directly relate back to a code passage. So the first thing, if, if you have the code memorized, you know I, I certainly don't. I don't think anybody has the code memorized, but you want to be familiar with where you approximately should go. And you'll be given those references, but the more you familiarize yourself with the table of contents. Um, and just the general layout, the more comfortable and confident you will feel on the exam actually going through these, these questions. Okay, so uh, we would wanna look at table 602. So table 602 is deciding the fire resistance rating requirements for exterior walls based on fire separation distance. So that's the distance between the building footprint and the property line. If we go back, we can see a little bit closer. We have three feet, 10 foot six, 15 feet, and 25 feet. So we automatically know when they're asking, okay, what's the north wall, what's the west wall? We automatically know the two walls we need to look at. The north wall is right here, since we have our north arrow pointing up, and the west wall is over here. 
I would recommend starting with the most stringent requirement and working backwards. That will save you time when it comes to, okay, if you get to a certain point, you know, you need to step back, you'll be able to have that time to, um, you know, start with the most stringent thing and work backwards. So obviously the most stringent would be the west wall since we're closest to that property line. And that distance was three feet. So if we go down to our table 602, we find our construction type, which is type 2B. So that could be any of these really. And we go by our occupancy. So we know it's a cafe. We know we have B use and we know we have residential on, on three and four. So this is the the column of the table that were of interest um, to us. So as we go down to fire separation distance, okay, we're less than five feet. So if we go from all types of construction, oh, no matter what, we're required to have one hour. So we know on that west wall, we're required to have one hour no matter what. But then if we go down and we look at the north wall, we're 10 feet six away from the property line, hey, we're actually not within that five to 10 feet. We can jump down and look at the 10 to 30 feet. And then you go over following the column. Okay, we're not 1A or 1B, and we're not 5B, and we're not others, we're 2B. So that 2B line carries over horizontally all the way to bingo, zero. We're not required to have a rating. So in this case, because we're looking at only these two types of walls, we're required to have zero hour rating and a one hour rating. So then because of that, the correct answer would be A. So those types of questions, they can take a lot of time. You gotta go back, you gotta find your references, but honestly, you know, having that comfortability, that, you know, that comfort level with getting to that table it will help you get to the, the solution even quicker. All right, so for question five, refer to the floor plans. Okay, now we're digging in a little bit deeper um, and identify the interior wall fire resistance rating requirements. So we know we're looking at interior fire rating and number of hours on each wall tag listed below. Okay, so we need to look at the wall tags. If no fire resistant construction is required, write zero. Great. Okay. So where is wall A? You look in the floor plan, oh, there's wall A. It's pointing to this wall. So there's our wall tag. We are separating the A occupancy and the B occupancy. So if we go to our references in the IBC, same kind of thing that we had to do previously. No, have, you know, have a general framework, which table we need to go to. Um, have that level of where you can go into the code and say, okay, I know I need to go to chapter five because of, because of that question. So if we go to table 508, 508.4, this is our required separation in occupancies, uh, required separation of occupancies in hours. So this is kind of a matrix chart. So we can, you know, do this in the same fashion where you find your occupancy. Okay. We know the cafe is a, uh, a restaurant type function. And because we have went through the code and figured out that it's an A2, we can make that assumption um, or make that declaration rather that we're dealing with an A2. Because we're dealing with an office on the other side of the wall, we're dealing with a B. So between the two, what's the, what's the separation between the two? So go down to the table. You can do this either way. You can work this either direction. You're going to start with you're gonna start with A, or you could start with B, and then follow it across until you find B on this table, there's B. So then drop it down and you're either one hour if you're suppressed, which is sprinkler, the S, or two hours if you're non-suppressed. If we go back to the scenario, everything lies in the scenario, oh, we've got a sprinkler system, we're NFPA 13 on the first floor. That answers that. So we are at one hour. Okay, wall, wall A, one hour, done. Move on to wall B. So we're looking at, let's find it here in the plan. Okay, there's wall B. Cut a section, we're between a corridor, and that, for that matter, an egress corridor, and the B use occupancy. 
Okay, so what do we need to do if we're looking between a corridor and an occupancy? In that case, you would go to a means of egress chapter 10 and look for your corridor fire resistance rating. So then as you find that, you will go to your occupancy. And in this case, it's A and B because we're egressing both A and B into the stairwell leading out. Honestly, too, because this is a, you know, we have a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom, this is really an access corridor. So we have to assume that, you know, even though we have that door here, people might still be egressing out of here and into the, into the stairwell and out. So A and B, occupant load served by corridor greater than 30. Without a sprinkler system, oh, remember we have a sprinkler system. Okay, good. We're not required to rate that corridor because of uh, A or B use is feeding into it. So wall B is a zero. Okay, last one here, wall C. Let's find wall C. Oh, it's separating the stairwell from the B occupancy, so from the office. So then you have to think, okay, what's the best way to go to, um, you know, your means of egress sizing? Uh, you also look at your fire resistance rating and you try to figure out what the best location for a shaft enclosure or an egress stair takes you. And probably after bouncing around a little bit, you will land on uh, chapter seven, section 713.4. And, you know, I know we're going through all these references like, hey, you should know this. In the virtual workshop, we actually pull up the code. You know, we go through all these sections together. We find how we get to them. And we try to break down some of the, the strategies in that, you know, getting to that correct answer. So it's not as you shouldn't, you know, have these memorized. No one does. Um, we just want to familiarize you with how to get to those sections. So that's something you can look forward to in the virtual workshop um, that we do on Sundays. So let's go to our fire resistance rating. We read through all this section. Shaft enclosures shall have a fire resistance rating of not less than two hours where connecting four stories or more. There's our answer. We have four stories because in the code or in the um, scenario we were talking about, um, the residential units on the set on the third and fourth floor. So we can't go any less than two hours. So that has to be at least two. So then if we go through, our best answer then is B. Because we're looking at wall A as one hour, wall B is zero hours, wall C is two hours. All right. Well, that's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to absorb. You know, the more you the more you go through these um, these code elements and and sift through them, the more you kind of understand circular references or you know directive references where you find something that leads you to another section. Um, and the best thing that you can approach all of these you know more intense types of questions with, like we just dealt with number four and number five, is to have that have that ready to go, have that confidence to just bounce around as you need to on the exam, treat it as if, you know, you're solving a problem in the office. It's no different. You just have to, you know, have that, you know, calm, cool, and collected demeanor to get to the section that you need, find the answer, and then get back out. The code is meant to be used as a reference tool. Hey, Mark, I got a, a thought that I wanted to share with you or share with sure. the group. Sure. Um, uh, because we're doing this uh, particular lesson here as a part of ARE Live, it's not so much of an interactive kind of experience. But if you're thinking about the actual virtual workshop experience, just so everybody knows the way it works is uh, that Mark would actually issue this, let's say this lesson uh, to you and, and basically group you into a small group of three to four people. And then you guys would work on solving the questions in the scenario uh, on your own. Uh, as a as a you know four person group, and then after about you know ten or fifteen minutes, uh, the uh, you know the uh, whatever they call them the um, whatever they call the breakout rooms are closed, and then folks can uh, can basically join the full session where Mark basically walks through how he would solve it. And so what's kind of cool about that is that you know you've already kind of worked with a couple people, try to come up with your answers, and then you get to basically watch. Um, 
you know, uh, you know, Mark, uh, the the instructor, go through the uh, go through the answers. So it's a really nice kind of interactive experience. Is, am, I, am I describing that right, Mark? You're exactly hitting the nail on the head, and I appreciate you saying that too. Um, the way, and honestly, it's in a way kind of like a study group. I mean, people are getting back together. Um, a lot of these people that join in the in the virtual workshops either communicate on the community or they just know each other right. from past workshops and they jump in the room uh, five minutes early and everyone's like, hey, good to see you. And it's it's really right. kind of like a study group. And and we just format it the same, the same way Mark said, you know, we do a minute of heads down um, to go through, you know, have 10 minutes or 15 minutes to review the question. And then we come back together and discuss why that's the best answer. So you have a chance to tackle it first and then we provide you with the reasoning and Kind of that justification to know what the best answer should be so yeah. it's a very interactive guided process like that like exactly like mark was saying i think also at the end if i remember correctly uh what you guys normally do is you guys then open it up uh, at the end of the session usually for 15 or so minutes you open it up so that folks it's sort of an open q a so even questions that aren't related to the actual lesson uh it's an open q a so if you're working on you know this exam PPD, and you're stuck on something. You can introduce a totally new question uh, for 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 the instructor to answer, or even for the group to answer. Is that how you usually exactly. handle it there, uh, Mark? Yeah, and we so every uh, Sunday when the workshops are held, um, you RSVP beforehand on the Black Spectacles dashboard, and right below that, there's a place where you can submit questions early if you are doing research or you know actually going through the topics that we're going to cover that coming Sunday. We give you a list of all of the recommended Black Spectacles videos to watch as a prerequisite. Um, so as you're going through that, you have a chance right then and there to send a question to me. Um, it gives me, you know, a day or two to digest that question and actually formulate a good, concise answer. Um, so I have a chance to, you know, tackle the, the, the difficult questions you find or encountering and then bring that answer to you in the Q&A session of the workshop. But aside from that, we also have open Q&A. So as people are, you know, going through these workshops, if people are like, hold on, how in the world did you find, you know, table 508.4? I just don't yeah. understand where that came from. How did you just know that? Well, then we go into, you know, we look at the table of contents and the IBC. We break down, okay, this, this section refers to this. You know, you got to get to table 10. You got to get to chapter 10 to know means of egress. So you have to know those means of egress elements like stairwells, corridors, et cetera. Um, so there's there's a very much a guided process of getting through getting through the questions together, and it gives you a chance to ask all of those Q and A questions, you know, live during the workshop. That's great. Thanks, uh, Mark. I wanted to just clarify that for everybody. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as we're going through this with the area live, it's a little bit different, but you are seeing like a, it is. <laughs> you know, a real legitimate you know lesson uh, that we would go through. So uh, you're getting a great taste. So yeah, go right ahead uh, and, All right. and thanks for your continued good stuff here. Absolutely. Okay, so those were two pretty heavy questions. So, um, you know, we also try to balance out and, and pull in some other questions that we can go back and just look at something quantitative. Okay, so which application is best to utilize a dry pipe sprinkler system? Okay, so if you're looking at dry pipe, um, you should know that dry pipe sprinkler system does not have any water sitting in the pipe or is not pressurized at the head location. It's There's a pre-action valve that exists somewhere else in the building, probably back at a standpipe or a riser or you know wherever you have that gate valve to, to stop the water from getting into your dry pipe system um, in order for the sprinkler heads to be, to be dry. So based upon that information, where is the best application to locate the dry pipe sprinkler system? Conditioned attic spaces, open air parking garages, data centers, or hotels. And after thinking through these, um, you, you could come across the answer right away and think, oh my gosh, this is easy. I obviously know it's going to be open air parking garage. And you would be correct. Um, you you want to make sure, though, you're looking at these, these questions closely. The, the correct answer is open air parking garage. You, it's not conditioned. If you're dealing with a climate that has freeze thaw, like I have in Ohio, <laughs> or even further north that we're currently all dealing with, um, you have to be considerate of of those sprinkler heads and their and their ability and the sprinkler lines and their ability to freeze and burst. 
So if you were looking at an unconditioned attic space, that would also be a good, a good option for a dry pipe sprinkler system. But since this is a conditioned attic space, we have, uh, you know, we have a temperature that we're maintaining um, that tells me we're insulated. We have protection from freezing, temp freezing temperatures, so it's really not conditioned attic spaces. Um, when looking at data centers, you know, data centers are a very specific type of, of use. They, they commonly utilize a, a halon gas system or even the newer FM200 compressed gas fire suppression system. Um, they have a, they have a way that they're discharging chemicals in order to protect the equipment that's in the data center. So that would not be a that would not have water as the means of um, suppression. It would be halon gas. And then if you look at the you know a hotel component, um, hotels and um, and other kind of residential functions of that nature very commonly utilize wet pipe sprinkler systems. In a way, you want to have that immediate discharge. You want to have that head um, really soaking the room if if there is a fire to contain it, since people are sleeping and they're you know compromised. That if there's a fire in the middle of the night, you need to have that immediate delivery of of fire suppression to isolate the incident. So hotels would not be a good instance for a dry pipe sprinkler system. So that's what makes that open air parking garage the best answer. So which material is most commonly specified for a wet pipe sprinkler system inside a conditioned commercial building? Okay, so now we're looking at wet pipe sprinkler system and the actual material that it would be. So is it Schedule 40 PVC, Schedule 80 PVC, copper, or cast iron? So if we go through these, Schedule 40 PVC is commonly utilized for underground wet pipe sprinkler systems um, as the main around the exterior of a building. So if you're familiar, you know, if we look at a section cut here, say we have a building and a foundation and then a floor level inside. If we have a, a frost line of like 30 inches, we need to have that fire line be down below that frost line, right? Because we're having active water flowing through it and we need to get into the building. The fire line will probably exist down here, travel under the footing somehow, or maybe even sometimes through the footing and then penetrate up into the building before it becomes a, um, a riser. It would also not take that sharp of a turn. That would be <laughs> there would be tons of water, water hammer, and this would need a thrust block like crazy right there. Um, so as it, as it enters into the building, you know, that's that's kind of the the most common use of how a an exterior sprinkler system works, and that system is most commonly either Schedule 40 or Schedule 80 PVC. Um, the reason being, you know, that that material can be in the earth. Uh, it can also be cast iron in some cases, usually old old systems, but, you know, installed in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. Um, I know a lot of the projects that I'm working on have cast iron fire loops, and we're going back and replacing with um, like Schedule 80 PVC just for longevity. Um, copper, on the other hand, if you're looking, is is commonly specified for for water distribution but it's usually for domestic water and you know hot and cold um, distribution into the building. It's not usually used for wet pipe sprinkler systems because it's much more expensive of material. Um, it's also really good to be, you know, to use for compressed air lines. You can, you know, solder the connections. You can have a much better joint than you would on, on plastic lines when it comes to compressed air. And they just they they hold and they last at their connection points really well over time. So copper, eh, not the best option. And then cast iron. Honestly, cast iron is the most common. Um, it's it's generally everywhere you're at. Um, it's it's a uh, durable material which you really want to have <laughs> for a for a sprinkler system because you know you're if you're dealing with a restaurant like in like in our scenario or a business, you know, you're going to have activity above the ceiling or um, you're, they're going to be there for a, a long time and need to last and not have their joints fail. So having those actual threaded connections in the cast iron 
where you're actually able to, you know, seal the pipe with your, you know, your joint is really the best connection for a sprinkler system because you can get that bond unlike you would really get with a plastic, you know, PVC connection that would be probably somewhat like this. And everybody's familiar with, you know, PVC and how they function. Those would butt together, you would glue the joints or use a clamp of some sort. Um, it's commonly used or it's it's sometimes used, but I would say most commonly, as the question stated, the best answer would be cast iron. Okay. All right, then our last question for today. Um, and th again, this is really just kind of a glimpse into what the virtual workshop is like. You, We get much more time um, you know, in the workshop for people to jump in and say, hold on, let's go back, let's look at this question again. Why is that the better answer than this? Um, there's a little bit of dialogue that we can have in between these questions too. So which IBC chapter would you need to check to confirm the allowable building height? Okay, that keyword, allowable building height. <laughs> so if we go in, I know we keep referring back to it, but table 504.3 is the best instance to figure out where you would have the allowable height of construction in a building based upon their main, classif uh, main classification of occupancy and their type of construction. So here's our occupancy type and here's our type of construction. So this table is found in uh, chapter 504.3. So chapter five would be the best answer. So going through, and this, I think this is very similar to the table we looked at above. You know, it's a, it's a matrix style table. Um, you look at two different um, quantities or two different items. You're cross-referencing them to find the correct answer. So let's say, you know, for our building type that we just looked at before, what would be the allowable height? So here's our, here's our uh, use there. We also have an R use there. If we pop over here, oh, we have an FPA sprinkler systems 13R and an FPA 13D. So we remember NFPA 13R was mentioned. So what's our allowable height for our type 2B building? So if we look at 2B, we drop all the way down. For an R, it's 60 feet above grade plane. So the table itself actually says um, above grade planes. That'll define how tall you're allowed to go. And then if we're looking at our A, B, E, F, or um, other mixed uses in the building, you know, we have our rest, we have our restaurant or cafe and our B occupancy use group as well. That's a sprinkler use. We drop over here. I need to erase a little bit so I can see what I scribbled over. And we're at 75 feet tall for a type 2B construction. So because we have a conflicting piece of information here and here, what do we do? Well, we're most likely limited to the most stringent option, which is 60 feet. So even though we have two answers here that are applicable, we have to stick with the most stringent, which would be 60 in this case, if we have a mixed use building. Boom. All right. There we go. There is a, you, there is a little taste of what you can expect to see in the virtual <laughs> workshops. I That's laugh Mark, because there's so much collaboration going on during the workshop. It's, it's, uh, it's really energetic and um, it's it's just so exciting to have all those people throw those questions back and forth. And um, it keeps me on my toes at all times. So I feel like, you know, this is a little, it's this is a different flavor of that kind of energy <laughs> that we have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a hunch, which is why I was asking. So that's great, man. I appreciate uh, all your help on, on this. And uh, so I wanna thank you. I wanna thank everybody for tuning in. Um, uh, that was obviously a ton of information you can walk away with in an hour. So, uh, again, it's very awesome. Thank you, uh, Mark. As I mentioned to you guys at our next ARE live broadcast on March 18th uh, of 2021, we'll be hosting a panel discussion on the new ARE format, uh, where we're going to be talking with people who have taken the ARE from home via the online proctoring. So you definitely want to tune in for this one. They're going to share their experiences with the new exam delivery method, so you know exactly what to expect. Um, and we just posted a link 
uh, in the chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can just go to blackspectacles.com slash podcast to sign up. To learn a little bit more about all of our airy exam prep offerings at Black Spectacles, you can go to blackspectacles.com where you can try out any of our course videos. And we just dropped that link in as well. Um, as a reminder, we're kicking off 2021 by launching our Pass the ARE Guarantee. We're confident that our customers who use our, uh, the expert membership to their fullest will pass the ARE. And if they don't, we're putting where our money where our mouth is and we're paying for their retake. Um, to learn more about how to qualify for the guarantee or to check out our individual memberships to see what kinds of materials we offer, you can go to blackspectacles.com slash ARE5examprep. The lucky winner of a Black Spectacles t-shirt uh, t-shirt is Christine. Uh, Christine, we will reach out to you via email to get your size and shipping information. So stay tuned for that. And just a reminder for everybody, if you'd like to be eligible to win a t-shirt, post a question uh, you have about our featured topic in the community during during the next ARE Live. And you know, it's worth noting, our community uh, is always buzzing. It's not just during ARE Live. Uh, we, we, we try to leverage it uh, just to sort of introduce it to new people, um, but it's available for all of you. It's free. Uh, you don't need to be a member in order to participate. It's a great place. We have experts who are tuned in, uh, licensed architects who answer questions uh, that folks post. It's also a great place to find some inspiration. Uh, we have lots of folks who post their stories about how they passed, the struggles that they had, and so on and so forth. So it's a great uh, it's a great uh, resource for a lot of a lot of different folks uh, at, at all the different stages uh, in on the path to licensure. Now, for those of you who are ready to start studying for the ARE right now, you can use our exclusive coupon code ARE Live Feb 21, uh, which should be on the screen, I think, right now, to get 10% off all our expert memberships, whether one, six, or 12 month. You can use it for any of those memberships. And just keep in mind that you need to use that coupon code before uh, our next ARE Live airs on March 18th of 2021, because that's when it expires. Uh, and then finally, tomorrow, we're going to send you an email follow-up about today's live broadcast. So please let us know what you think. Share any suggestions that you may have. Also, be sure to stick around for one more second um, and take the survey right after this webinar to also give us some feedback. We read every word that you guys write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.